And I think, I mean, the argument of my book in a nutshell is that this war was fundamentally, fundamentally about Georgia trying to go west and Russia determined to stop it, in which the conflicts were instrumentalized. But, you know, it's 2010, and 20 years ago we signed something called the Charter of Paris. Uh, there were several people in the room that were probably active at that time. And people like me have spent the last 20 years trying to build this new post-Cold War peace based on these principles. And those principles included no spheres of influence, uh, the right of countries to choose their own path, their own alliances, equal security for all countries, big and small. And I would say that that document, which we sort of see as the Bill of Rights of a new Europe, is a dead letter as far as Moscow is concerned. Hey, welcome to another one of my crazy attempts to understand the insanity that we call this world. Here we'll be going over the book, a Little War That Shook the World by Ronald Asmus who served as the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, specifically during the Clinton administration. At the same time, he also assisted with the German Marshall Fund and worked as a part-time advisor to Mikhail Saakashvili, who was president of Georgia in 2008 during the events that the book describes. With that, the main focus of the book is the 2008 conflict between Russia and Georgia, known as the Russo-Georgian War, and more specifically, the diplomatic backdrop behind how that conflict happened. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is that the main concept of this book is not to serve as a pure historical account of the war itself. While it does contain quite a bit of information that is useful for understanding the history and build up to the conflict, this is generally not the main narrative nor argument that Asmus is making within the book itself. The historical record is placed within a narrative that helps to contextualize the Russo-Georgian War within the wider problem of geopolitics that was occurring at the time. The author, Asmus is essentially making the argument that the Russo-Georgian War was not a small ethnic nor territorial conflict as it generally can be viewed as, but more specifically that it was the first major conflict between the West and Russia since the end of the Cold War, and that it signaled a move towards further misalignment between these two groups both internationally and ideologically. To that end, Asmus brings up two major events in the lead up to the conflict and how they ultimately contributed to both the rising tension in the Caucasus and the shift in Russia's geopolitical goals. Now, as I've said with previous videos, I will state again with this one, this is not a deep analysis of the book, nor is this a sufficient replacement for reading the book itself. And in this case, I also want to make it especially clear that I am not, I am not an expert in this region, neither historically nor politically. Rather, I am simply trying to extract and explain the main through line of the book overall, both as a way of reinforcing what I've read, but also to generate possible interest in the book itself. After that, I will explain my own opinion regarding both what I learned from this book, but also how I see it within the current wider geopolitical context. As it is though, let's start with the book itself and the main arguments being made by Asmus. The main crux of the book is Ronald Asmus's argument regarding why the Russo-Georgian War was not just a one-off conflict, but rather a signal to the wider international community regarding Russia's shift in foreign policy. The argument itself rests on two main points. First, the ethnic dimension of the conflict that arose in Georgia was absolutely there, and it played a part in how complex the situation was on the ground. Much of the historical background can be traced two centuries ago, and these are fundamental and existential aspects to those within the Georgian region. Yet very little of that history or ethnic tension was the primary driver for why the Russo-Georgian War started. To Asmus, these were secondary aspects that were being manipulated by Russia in order to further drive conflict within the region. As such, there isn't much within the book that explains that particular history. Instead, Asmus focuses on how these internal conflicts were utilized by Russia to further their position within the wider international scene, and to especially demonstrate to Europe and the United States that Russia was still a major influence within the region. 
Ultimately, Georgia was not the main target, but the unfortunate victim of a wider conflict. This ties in with the second point of Asmus' argument, which is that the conflict was started well before August of 2008. While Georgia was essentially reacting to elements on the ground in real time, much of the offense by Russia could only have been achieved if they had prepared and planned for a ground invasion of Georgia. In essence, Russia had already decided on war far before any of the other parties involved, and had directed itself towards that goal for months. In contrast, Georgia and the rest of the world were not prepared for conflict, and had taken steps to avoid the situation boiling over through half-baked diplomacy. This, according to Asmus, is what led to the situation in Georgia to go so wrong so quickly, as they didn't fully accept that Russia was willing and preparing for war. Instead, Russia was consistently appeased to, with almost no full assurances given to Georgia that the international community had their back. To support both of these claims, Asmus focuses on two major turning points within international politics and diplomacy, the independence of Kosovo and the Bucharest summit. Both of these events marked a turning point for Russia's approach to both the international diplomatic stage, but also how it shifted its policy regarding what it called the near abroad. The first turning point Asmus brings up was the overall blindness that the international community had when it came to their decision regarding Kosovo. While the book doesn't provide much history regarding Kosovo, allow me to give a very brief, uneducated summary. The history of Kosovo goes back centuries, with much of the ethnic tension in the region beginning to bubble during the period of communist Yugoslavia. By the 1980s, much of the tension began to boil into more armed conflict. In 1992, the region declared independence from Serbia as the Republic of Kosovo, though it was not recognized outside of Albania as its own nation. Over the next few years, this erupted into a civil war within the region, generally referred to as the Kosovo War. In 1998 and 99, a large NATO campaign intervened to stop the ongoing conflict, as it had boiled over into a massive campaign involving ethnic cleansing, with some claiming that the Serbian government had participated in genocide, though no charges of genocide itself manifested within the international courts. Between 1999 and 2008, the territory of Kosovo, which existed under the protection of the United Nations and NATO, was still part of Serbia officially, and many nations debated whether to give it independence or to keep it as part of Serbia. In February of 2008, Kosovo, with the backing of the majority of UN states, declared its independence from Serbia. Yet among the holdouts for recognizing that independence was Russia. Asmus's argument regarding Kosovo is multifaceted and ties into many of the changes that were occurring within the wider Eastern European sphere during the post-Soviet era. Yet, the main thrust was that there were two major fears that Russia began to develop as a result of the overall conflict. First, Russia began to view the intervention by NATO in 1999 as a massive hammer that could be brought down on individual nations. To Russia, and especially to Putin, NATO had demonstrated that they were more than willing to use military force to keep countries in line. As Russia had strong diplomatic ties to the Balkan region, an internal Russian conversation started to ask whether they would be exempt from such action, or whether they could equally be on the list of nations that NATO would be willing to move against. Despite assurances otherwise, the idea never really left the minds of Moscow moving forward. In addition to that, Russia believed that the declaration of the independence of Kosovo in 2008 provided a reflection of this belief along diplomatic lines. Even when Russia and Serbia objected to the declaration, the UN and NATO went forward with the proposal due to overwhelming international support. In essence, Russia believed that this was the international community ignoring Russia, further provoking fears that they had no sway uh, within wider geopolitics. Asmus argues that these fears, while understandable, were incorrect on their face and should have been detected sooner by the international community. Russia was not only aware of NATO's intentions to intervene, but they had been party to discussions leading up to NATO's intervention. Russia was told explicitly by NATO how they planned to operate within the region, and they were included in the negotiations for ending the conflict in 1999. In addition, the debate regarding Kosovo independence not only included Russia as a primary negotiator for the Serbian cause, but their word was often given more favor among diplomats due to worries of agitating Russia. Ultimately, they didn't lose the vote out of being ignored or out of spite, but because there was too much international pressure to recognize Kosovo's independence. 
Yet it wasn't until Russia's response to Kosovo independence that the international community started to realize that Russia wasn't just unhappy with the outcome. Russia was, under the move towards more radical Eurasian approaches to foreign policy, more than willing to utilize the incident to further their own position. In the weeks following the declaration, Russia declared that Kosovo had set a new international precedent which they could use for their own, quote, ongoing territorial conflicts. Over the months following Kosovo's independence, Russia began to supply separatist groups within South Ossetia and Abkhazia with more weaponry, signed protection agreements, and began their passport policy, where a flood of Russian passports were given to people within both regions, giving them cover of claiming them as Russian citizens. Asmus argues that this wasn't just a random switch in policy, but a deliberate response to Kosovo, and should have been taken as a more serious sign that Russia's foreign policy goals had begun to rapidly shift, and especially in a potentially illegal manner, given that the passport policy is considered a violation of international law. The second event that Asmus focused on was the decision made during the NATO Bucharest Summit of 2008, occurring six weeks after the Kosovo Declaration, in which multiple nations were considered for NATO membership. Among them were both Ukraine and Georgia, who had experienced democratic movements in the years prior, and both made pleas to join both the European Union and NATO. Russia had made it abundantly clear that they opposed NATO membership to either of these nations, and this played a large role in how negotiations moved forward during Bucharest itself. Both Germany and France were opposed to extending the NATO membership action plan, or MAP, to either Ukraine or Georgia, as it could potentially kick off a new Cold War with Russia. The US, especially President Bush, pushed as hard as he could to supply MAP to both countries. In the end though, it was ultimately decided that neither country would be extended MAP, but they had made a declaration that they will, at some future time, become members of NATO. This was essentially the final nail in the coffin when it came to Russia's international cooperation. While the color revolutions made Russia start to fear Western influence, and Kosovo told them that they weren't the biggest player in the region anymore, Bucharest essentially drove home that the world was moving forward with or without Russia. All the latent fears of a Western takeover of Eastern Europe became solid in Russia's mind. Even if MAP was not extended to Ukraine or Georgia, the fact that NATO was considering it was enough, and they responded harshly against the declaration. To this day, Russia still asks for the US and the EU to overturn the 2008 Bucharest decision as unnecessarily provocative, even though they have done so on multiple occasions, especially after the Russo-Jordan War. To this, Asmus argues that Russia, again, had fears that were sympathetic, but unfounded. Russia was both fully aware of the decision beforehand, and they had been part of the negotiations prior to the decision, but they had already agreed to multiple declarations of allowing previous Soviet states to join NATO. The very reason that MAP was not extended to either Ukraine or Georgia was specifically at the request of Russia. Yet it wasn't enough that they got what they demanded, rather the very idea that the thought was considered was enough to justify their fears of the West. Immediately following the Bucharest summit, Russia moved to bolster their peacekeeping forces within both Abkhazia and South Ossetia, removing further restrictions on the shipment of weapons, removing Georgia from negotiation tables, and started to conduct military training along the border, though Russia tends to claim that most of this was as a response to NATO training programs. To Georgia, this was a clear sign that war was not only possible, but likely imminent, and that an invasion became a question of when, rather than if. To the international community, this appeared to be pomp and circumstance, and they urged Georgia not to react. Unfortunately, this may have been the response that Moscow was looking for. By the time the Russo-Georgian War broke out, every attempt to negotiate had failed, both by Georgia and the international community. Asmus argues that this was essentially the point. By the time Bucharest had finished, Russia had decided that it was past negotiations, and had begun preparing for a full-scale invasion. To Asmus, the greatest failure was the international community's inability to notice the fact, and to continue urging Georgia to keep going on as if business was normal, while treating Russia with too much respect. More could have been done by the international community to prevent the escalation, including placing either EU or UN peacekeepers within the region, sanctioning Russia, or possibly providing Georgia with more military equipment. Yet the international community believed that doing so would provoke war itself, essentially tying their hands on the situation. 
Unfortunately, by the time the war started on the 8th of August 2008, it was essentially too late for Georgia, and the result was Russia's ability to bully one of its neighbors while also discrediting Georgia as a nation. More than 15 years later, this still appears to have succeeded. To this day, Georgia is still hoping for NATO and EU membership but it has been continually denied every bid to do so. The South Ossetia and Abkhazia regions are still occupied by Russian forces, and as other conflicts take the main stage, Georgia continues to be placed as a secondary concern for the world. Overall though, Asmus believes that this is the unfortunate consequence of the conflict within the region overall. Russia didn't care about Georgia. Russia was simply using Georgia as a way of getting back at the West. To Asmus, this is really the great tragedy of the Russo-Georgian War, in that the international community essentially told Georgia that they had to wait, be patient, and just not react. Meanwhile, Russia didn't even treat Georgia as if it were a primary concern. It was just a bidding chip within a wider conflict that it was perpetuating among the international community. In short, Asmus believes that Georgia truly deserved better. Before we get into my own thoughts, I did want to bring up the fact that there were two separate movies made shortly after the Russo-Georgian War, one from Russia and one from the US, with supposedly some funding from Georgia, though Georgia does dispute that. Needless to say, both are easy to identify as propaganda, and both are hilariously upfront about it. The, the first one to be released, just months after the conflict ended, was Olympus Inferno from the Russian side, and it's hilariously over the top in showing the Georgians to be mindless civilian killing machines. There's a whole scene where the Georgian military is driving down a street and just blowing up every single house they see, and it's played over this slow, somber soundtrack with just the most obvious tearjerker imaginable. And given how quickly it was rushed out, you can tell it's just one of those one-take-who-cares types of movies. If you want to watch it, there is a version on YouTube that has English subtitles. Which isn't to say that the other film, Five Days of War, is any better. It has sort of the opposite problem in that it was as boring as they come, while still clearly being a propaganda piece. The shots are better, compositions better, soundtracks better, but it's still just flat, boring, generic action. Still, the movie is overall focused on showing how the Russians are just the worst people. At least you get a few scenes here and there with Val Kimmer that give me a good chuckle. That one's actually free on Tubi if you're interested. Oh, and as a comparison between these two, believe it or not, both of them are focused around journalists that are fighting against an international narrative of who actually fired the first shot. Obviously, the Russian one spends the whole time following an American journalist who is trying to persuade the world that Russia was not the aggressor within the conflict, and then the Five Days of War one, uh, you have a journalist that's trying to fight against the idea that Russia was actually the defender here, that Georgia was actually the one fired upon first. When I saw it in the first film, it was already kind of funny, especially just how much runtime actually focuses on that particular plot point. And then when I saw it in the second film, I just had to laugh my ass off at, at how obvious both of these were paralleling each other in trying to get a particular narrative out. As it is, though, the existence of both of these films actually highlight one of the bigger problems regarding the Russo-Georgian War overall, which is that narratives of how the war played out were hotly contested. Even with several fact-finding missions into the region, it's hard to determine who actually started the conflict outright, as small skirmishes had been occurring several months prior to the conflict, with a ramp up in shelling and bombing the week prior between Georgia and South Ossetia. The fact that two movies, both showing very different narratives to the war, with both being obvious ploys to win over audiences, says quite a bit about how murky the conflict was overall, and how difficult it is to say who actually fired the first shot. Though as a side note, do check into the fact-finding missions yourself if you have any interest. As it turns out, both are contemned roundly for their particular failure within the war, while Georgia is often believed to be the one that fired the first shot in that they overreacted to shelling that came from South Ossetia, 
it's typically that Russia was internationally condemned for ethnic cleansing and essentially preparing an invasion force. Now again, this was not a robust examination of everything that was laid out in the book. I will say that my own lack of historical knowledge made this a bit of a difficult read, as I had to continually look up extra information to make sure I understood what Asmus was saying. To be fair though, this was not a book primarily written for the average person. Asmus himself stated that the book was primarily aimed for those within the community of international politics itself, so there is the assumption that the reader is familiar with much of the background information. With the majority of the information that Asmus himself is bringing is more information about the backroom discussions that were occurring at any of these events. Still, there were many aspects that I found to be more than useful. For example, much of the last chapter lays out the primary argument that Asmus made regarding Russia's new position within the world stage after the Russo-Georgian War, essentially simplifying much of the previous information into a more coherent narrative. He then expressed his worries about how much of this would likely continue in a new precedent for the international stage. There's even a portion where he explicitly states that one of the worries was that the conflict would eventually mean a new offensive in Crimea, which happened just four years after the book's publication. As for me, I would say that the biggest strength of the book is that it is not unkind to Russia's fears overall. A mistake I often see from people is that empathy with a position means that one must fully adopt that position. Even today, in the context of Ukraine, we see plenty of commentators and TV pundits who bring up the question of Russia's security, but then use that to bulldoze any explanation contrary to the Russian position. What I think Asmus does a good job of explaining is Russia's concerns, while also being critical of them. For all intents and purposes, Russia was entering into the international scene as a brand new country, and their fears were not only understandable, but in many cases, properly empathetic, which explains why so many random Americans go along with Russia propaganda. There's something about the narrative that is enticing. To Asmus, though, it is not the underlying reasons by themselves that one should look at. Rather, it should be understood that Russia's fears had little to no basis, especially when they had been part of the negotiating table with NATO since 1997, and had developed somewhat amicable relations with both the EU and the US. Yet, instead of relying on their new goodwill and diplomatic position, Russia's approach under Putin was to quietly cut ties with the world and fall back on old notions of a Eurasia separate and distinct from the West. The worst part about this direction was that Russia's actions were not properly aligned with dealing with their fears, and, Asmus believes, they've set themselves back by taking a hard Eurasian approach to the wider international community. In the wake of Crimea and Ukraine, I do have to agree with Asmus on this one. In short, while Russia's fears may be empathetic, it does not justify nor excuse Russia's strategy or their shift away from negotiation as stronger international cooperation. As it is though, I did say that my historical knowledge here is quite lacking, so I've picked up the Ghost of Freedom to help me situate myself more within the history of this region. In time, my goal is to develop a more robust understanding of the history of Russia and its near abroad, so I can better grasp the backdrop of current events. After that book, I've got the Great Gamble regarding the Soviet-Afghan conflict, and I'm reading these in parallel to Wested's The Cold War to help me get a more global perspective. If you've got some other books worth looking into, I'm happy to take suggestions. As it is, thanks for sticking with me this far, and I hope you have a good one.